want to would like for you to open up your Bibles with me, if you will, to Mark 9. Mark 9 verses 1 is where we'll be at this morning. How many of you have ever seen something so spectacular that it was hard to describe it to others? Maybe some of you are thinking about, maybe you've been to uh, the Grand Canyon. I haven't, but I heard it's a, a wonderful place to visit, that you can see God's creation. Uh, I'm, maybe some of you, if you've been to Mount Everest, all the, the places in, in different, in different uh, places in the world that are, are spectacular, and when you go to them, you can see the, the wonder and the, glor- and the glory of God in, in creation. You can see all this. I think for me, though, uh, for me, when I think about um, something that, that stands out so, so much to me that it impacted me so much, is it was probably when I, when I, when I had Penelope and Mila. I say when, when Galexis birthed, her, birthed them. Um, it, was such a, 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 it was such a great, uh, it was hard to, to describe it at the moment. I remember when, them, when they came out and I was holding them in my hands and I seen their, their beautiful faces. And, you know, this, this question comes into, came into my mind. It's like, how did this happen? How in the world, did, if for nine months, did they grow in their mom's tummy and they come out and they're so beautiful and so precious? Uh, for me, this, was, this took it away from everything else that I've ever experienced in my life. I thought to myself, how could this be? How could they develop in Galexis' stomach? How could it be so precious and so beautiful? Um, and I was in sp- speechless and in awe. You know, if you're a parent, I'm sure you could probably go back to those moments and you can remember when, when your kids came out and you were able to hold them in your hands. It was hard for me to, to comprehend it. It was breathtaking and mysterious and wonderful. And I remember I couldn't stop giving thanks to God for the privilege and the responsibility of, of to be able to be their parents and to be able to, to, to lead them in, in God's ways. Well, in the, in the passage this morning, Jesus unveils his glory to Peter, James, and John. And he, he reveals himself to them in, in such an incredible way that, that they had never seen before. Our big idea this morning is that Jesus is transfigured and the disciples behold his glory. Let's read in Mark 9, 1. And he said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter and James and John and led them up on the, high, on the high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His clothes became shining, exceedingly white like snow, such as no launderer on earth can whiten them. And Elijah appeared to them with, with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three, three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah because he did not know what to say. And for they were greatly afraid. And a cloud came and overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. And suddenly when they looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with themselves. Now as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one of the things they had seen. So the Son of Man had risen from the dead. And so they kept this word to themselves, questioning what the rising from the dead meant. And they asked him, saying, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Then he answered and told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and restores all things, and how it is written concerning the Son of Man, that he must suffer many things and be treated with contempt. But I say to you that Elijah has also come, and they did to him whatever they wished, as it is written to him, as it is written of him. Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, we, um, Lord, as we give attention to your word, as we seek your face today, Lord, it's our, it's our desire this morning to know you. To know your word and to, to Lord, to this morning that we can leave with a, a greater sense of, of who you are and how great and how magnificent you are, so much greater than our understanding. And so we pray, God, that your spirit would work in our hearts Lord, that you would speak to us and show us your word. God, that we can 
Apply it to our hearts and our lives, Lord. Lord, we ask this in, uh, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to look at this in, in two different uh, parts this morning. Jesus revealed and Jesus reveals. Last week, we, we saw at the end of Mark 8, the cost of discipleship. That it is, it is truly a, a high cost and a high calling to, to follow Jesus. And you cannot be his disciple in your own strength. That through, the, through his power and grace, God is the one who enables us to be the believers, to be the followers of Jesus. To be able to, to lay down our lives, to be able to deny ourselves, and to be able to, to take up our cross and to follow Jesus. That it's truly only a, a work of God that God can do in our lives that as we desire to come after him, as God puts that heart, the desire, as God works in our life, he produces the, the desires to, to seek him and to go after him, even though in the many moments in our lives that we don't, we want to go our own way. We want to do our own thing, but when we make it Jesus' will and we make it our desire to do his will, God leads us and he's able to work in our lives and he's able to, to cause his kingdom to come and to be and be manifested in our lives. In our text this morning, Jesus takes his disciples up on the high, the high mountain and reveals himself to them. Let's pick up in, in, in verse 1. And he said to them, Assuredly, I, I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. This is a, a continuation of the, of the previous chapter, this verse. That Jesus had just told, told them that those who were, who were ashamed of him, in verse 38, he would also be ashamed of them when he came in, in the glory of his Father. And so Jesus continues to tell them that, that there were some there that would be alive to see the kingdom of God having come with power. Now, there are, are a, f- a few different interpretations of this, of what Jesus is talking about here. Some believe that he is he's talking about Jesus' transfiguration. Some believe that he's talking about his resurrection and his ascension. Some believe that he's talking about the, the coming Holy Spirit at Pentecost. But I believe that we have the answer, considering the, the text and how it lays out. That his transfiguration, I believe, is the, the most reasonable viewpoint as we look into this. So Jesus is, is telling his followers that, that there are going to be some that are with him that are, that are not going to taste death till they see the kingdom of God present with power. Notice in verse 2 it says, Now after six days Jesus took Peter, James, and John. So six, six days elapse and Jesus takes him up on the mountain. That I believe in this that we see here in the, the transfiguration is that Jesus is, is giving his disciples a, a preview, a preview of his glory and the, of the kingdom of God that came with power. That if you remember, as we talked about, as Jesus preached the kingdom of God, that we know that the, the king is Jesus in the kingdom. That Jesus is manifesting himself, that Jesus is proclaiming the truth, that Jesus is preaching the gospel and people are hearing the message. But it's Jesus that is the king of the kingdom. And as we traveled through Mark 8, we have seen some some significant events in the life of Jesus and his disciples. The most significant, one of the significant events that we read about in, in Mark 8 is that is that Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? And remember, it was Peter who said that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. It was Peter that was acknowledging that Jesus is the Messiah and the Anointed One, the one that they had had all been waiting for. Then Jesus tells them that the the Son of Man is, is going to suffer and be rejected by the elders and then be killed and, and would rise again on the third day. If you remember that, that the disciples didn't receive it well. In fact, they, they didn't understand it. They couldn't comprehend it. And, and you remember that Peter blurted out 
Not so, Lord. He took him to the side and he tried to rebuke Jesus. But it was Jesus that told him, Get thee behind me, Satan, for you are an offense to me. For he was not, not mindful of the plan of God. But for the disciples, it, it didn't make sense to them. For the disciples, they couldn't comprehend that they were looking for a Messiah who, who didn't have to suffer. They were looking for a, a Messiah that was, would be a national conqueror, who would be a political power, who would overthrow Rome. But the path of Jesus was, was through suffering to the cross. This was the, the plan of God. And last week we finished and we talked about the, the high cost of discipleship. Of what a true follower of Jesus looks like. That those who, who are his disciples, they, they deny themselves, they take up their cross. They abandon their, their own ways. And they follow his ways. They recognize that, that his ways are, are so much better than than our ways. They recognize that they have a, a new identity in Christ. And because they have a new identity in Christ, they have a, a new master who dictates their life, who wants to, to lead their life, who wants to, to lead them to produce fruit in their lives. We just talked about that this morning about in John 15 where it talks about how Jesus commanded his disciples that to remain in him. To abide in Him, and it's only when we abide in Christ that we can produce fruit that lasts in our lives. And so it is Jesus, in this light of all this, He takes Peter, James, and John up on the high mountain to unveil Himself. But we know that, that although the disciples struggled with accepting the path that Jesus was headed on and they didn't comprehend it, that Jesus continues to show them more. Remember, 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, is the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to those who are, who are being saved, is it is the, the power of God. They couldn't understand it, but Jesus was patient with them to show them the way. And so it is in this that Jesus continues and he continues to show them more and more he actually takes peter james and john's and and separates them and takes them up on the mountain and there he is transfigured before them verses two it says and his verse two now after six days jesus took peter james and john and led them up on the high mountain apart by themselves and he was transfigured before them As we said before, the, his transfiguration, Jesus unveiled his splendor and his deity. That up to this point in time, Jesus had, had revealed himself in, in different ways. That he revealed himself in different, in different ways. His, his, he showed him his power over nature. As he calmed the wind and the sea, he displayed his, his power over demons as he delivered the demoniac of, of the Gadarenes. He showed his, uh, his ability to, to multiply the bread and the fish to feed the 5,000 and to feed the 4,000. But in this transfiguration, Jesus reveals himself to Peter, James, and John, and he shows him a brief glimpse of his divine glory as he is transformed before them. Now, I'll, I'll be referring to, to actually some... Another account, which is in Luke 9. So if you don't see anything in here in Mark 8, it's probably from Mark 9 or, or Matthew 17 because they all give some different features from, from this account. But Luke 9, 28 tells us that, that they went up to the mountain to pray. That he took his disciples up to the mountain. And there he is praying with them. Now, many believe it was, it was Mount Hermon where, they, where this had happened at. Peter, James, and John were, were given sight to their faith. Peter had just proclaimed and acknowledged that he was the, the Christ. And here it is on the mountaintop that Jesus reveals his glory to them. And we were told that, that Jesus 
was transfigured. The, the word transfigured means to change in form or to be transformed. It was in his, his transfiguration that Jesus manifested some of his divine glory. Warren Rearsby says it like this, the word transfigured describes a change on the outside that comes from the inside. It is the opposite of, of masquerade, which is an outward chain that does not come from within. Jesus allowed his glory to radiate through his whole being, and the mountaintop became a holy of holies. If you can just, just stop for a moment, you know, this account in, in Scripture is, you know, maybe it's familiar for some of us, but if we can just grasp and think about what, what is really happening in this, as Jesus reveals himself to his disciples. Verse 3 says that his clothes became shining and exceeding white, like snow, such as no launder, launderer on earth can whiten them. So we're told that, that Jesus' clothes become shining and exceedingly white, like snow. Other versions say that they became dazzling and radiant and intensely white. What we know is that, that nothing in this world could be that white. Not even using a lot of bleach or a lot of laundry detergent. But it says that Jesus began to, to radiate before them. Luke also, Luke also says that his face was altered as well. The glory that, that Jesus was displaying to them was like nothing they have ever had ever experienced before. It was as if Jesus was, was pulling the veil of his humanity back and shining like the sun. Revelation 1.16 says, he had, he had in his right hand seven stars out of his mouth and with a sharp two-edged sword and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. This is what Mark is, is describing as Jesus is transformed before them. That this morning, if you can, if you can grasp in your mind that, that Jesus is, is so much bigger than our imagination. He's so, so much greater than what we can comprehend. In fact, if, if you can comprehend Jesus, then he's too, he's too small for you. That he's so much bigger, he's so much better, he's so much superior than anything that we can ever imagine. That this was something that, that Jesus held back. Everyone who saw Jesus seen him as an ordinary man. And this was a part of the, the plan of God, that his greatness and majesty was hidden. Look what it says in Isaiah 53 two: My servant grew up, this is speaking of Jesus, in the Lord's presence, like a tender green shoot, like a root in dry ground, there is nothing beautiful or majestic about his appearance, nothing to attract us to him. What this is saying here, and, and in other words, is that Jesus was normal, just like everyone else. If Jesus was, was, was with his disciples, you probably could, if you never knew him, you probably, didn't, you probably couldn't pick him out because he was like, looked like an ordinary man. Philippians 2, 6 through 7 says, Who being in the, the form of God didn't consider it robbery to be equal with God. Look at what it says in verse 7. But he, he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. So as Jesus reveals himself to his disciples, he gives them a glimpse of something that they, have never, they had never seen before up to this time. Jesus shines and radiates before them with his divine glory. And the disciples see Jesus visibly with power and excellence. Like it will be when he returns to establish his kingdom on the earth. So many people have these different pictures of who they think Jesus is. That he's, he's just an, an or, that he's, that he's just a, 
maybe a, a person that is meek and that is humble. But the Bible says that when he comes back, he's going to be coming back to execute his judgment. In Revelation, we have a picture of Jesus that he is the, the lion, the, lion that, the, the lamb that was slain. But he's also the lion. He's the lion of the tribe of Judah. And I, be, I believe in this, that Jesus is revealing himself to them in a way that they, they couldn't comprehend it. Verse 4, And Elijah appeared to them with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. So now this, this picture gets even, even more complex. If you, could, if you could put yourself in the disciples' shoes, they see Jesus like they'd never seen him before. They see Elijah and Moses, who, who were significant uh, men who God used in the, the nation of Israel. God used Moses to bring, the Egyptian, to bring the Israelites out of Egyptian slavery. It was Moses that God used to, to bring the law of God to the children of Israel. And it was Elijah who was the defender of, of God's law, the upholder of true worship. You remember, it was Elijah who, who challenged the, the prophets of Baal. He was the, the defender of God's law, and he represented the prophets. Moses represented the law, and Elijah represented the, the prophets of God. They both come into the scene with Jesus. And it says they begin to talk with Jesus. And I think this morning it's, it's easy for us to, to gloss over it. To think of the, the significant event that was happening before the disciples. But this was a, a supernatural event. What, what were they talking about? Luke 9, 30, 31 says that they spoke to, of Jesus' death and departure. His departure that was going to happen in Jerusalem. This is incredible that, that these three talked together. All of them had a significant role in Israel, and it was Jesus who was the, the fulfillment of prophecy, and the prophecy that was unfolding, that Moses represented the law and Elijah the prophets, and Jesus the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. That it is Jesus, the, it is Jesus that the law and the prophets point towards. In fact, it's through Jesus that they find their perfect fulfillment in. That Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament. And what do the disciples do? Well, Mark doesn't tell us, but Luke says that they were, they were in a deep sleep. They fell asleep while all this is happening. Remember, it was a, the same response in the, in the Garden of Gethsemane where his disciples, his three disciples, gathered with him as Jesus was contemplating what he would experience. Where he asked the Father, if, it, if it's your will to take away this cup, take it away from me. And it was Jesus who encouraged his disciples. He came to them and said, watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. It was Jesus who, who was revealing himself to this in, the, in this instance, his glory. And, and what we see is that they awakened and they seen Jesus in all of his glory. And, we, and they seen Elijah and Moses. And, and Peter was compelled to, to say something like he normally was. Peter blurts out, verse 5 through 6. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, it is, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Because he did not know what to say, for they were greatly afraid. So Peter blurts out this idea. Rabbi, it's, it's good for us to be here. I'm sure as he, as he looked at this, at this situation, as he looked at what was going on, this supernatural event, you know, it even says that he, he didn't know what to say. And so he just spoke whatever was on his mind. 
It was in Peter's question that he, he may have viewed Jesus and Moses and Elijah having equal importance. And since he suggested that he should make three tents of shelters, Peter is once again looking at things from a, from a human perspective. It's what we saw last week as we as we, we seen uh, or in the week before as, as Peter is trying to rebuke Jesus. He's trying to look at the plan of God and the, the wisdom of God in, in human perspective. Daniel Aiken says this, Peter was, was so excited and scared that he just had to say something. His mind would, would only catch up with his words after the cross and the resurrection. I love this. He will nev- we will never understand the person and the work of Christ apart from the cross and the resurrection. Leave them out and he is, the, he is at best a moralist and at worst a self-destructive fool. Leave out the cross and there is, there is no atonement. Leave out the resurrection and there is no victory over sin. In sinful weakness, we, have, we would avoid the cross. Stay on the mountain and make ourselves comfortable. In contrast, Jesus will embrace the cross. He will ascend Calvary's hill and he will drink the cup of suffering filled with the wrath of God. For Peter, Peter didn't, Peter didn't want the suffering of the cross. That if it was up to Peter, he would, he would make, it, make it stop right there. But this was not the, the purpose and the plan of God. In fact, Jesus' desire and his obedience was set on fulfilling God's will. Fulfilling the, the purpose of God. And Jesus would not be deterred or distracted from doing this. Here we have another person that comes in. Verse 7, And a cloud came and overshadowed them. And a voice came out of the cloud saying this, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Notice who is also present as at Jesus' transfiguration. Remember, it was it was God who spoke from the who spoke when Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan River. And he spoke of his pleasure, he spoke of his endorsement of Jesus. And here he is at the transfiguration when. When Jesus is talking with the disciples, all of a sudden a cloud appears and overshadows them and the voice comes out of the cloud and says, this is my beloved son. This is the the Shekinah glory of God. That it was symbolic throughout the Old, Old, Old Testament of God's visible presence, God's manifest presence. And the voice comes out and of the cloud, and look what God says to his son. Peter had, had just made this outlandish comment, but then God speaks and says this, this is my beloved son. And what does he say to do? He says to hear him. Hear him, Peter. Listen, Peter, stop talking and listen to him. Listen to whom the, the law and the, the prophets declare. Listen to, to what he is saying about his path of suffering and him going to the cross. Hebrews 1, 1 through 4 says, God, at various times and in various ways, spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets. And in, it, and in these last days has spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he had made the world, the worlds. And being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power. And when he had himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high and having become so better than the angels as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. God the Father speaks from the cloud And he tells the disciples to hear him. For he knows what he is saying. That he can be trusted. That he is faithful. He is the faithful witness. That God's God's voice makes it clear in the transfiguration account that, that Jesus is greater than Elijah. He's greater than Moses and greater than anyone. For he is his beloved son. 
And he tells them to, to hear him, to listen to his voice, to listen to his commands, to listen to his words. And what, a, what a, 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 an incredible admonition for us this morning. As we think about all the, the, the noise that is in, going on in our world. All the different opinions, all the different things that the, the, man and, the man's ideologies and the, the false narratives that are, that are going on in our world. And how important it is us, for us to, to listen to God's word. To give time to it. To allow God's word to, to penetrate into our heart. I love how, how Psalms 1 says it. Blessed is the man that, that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And this is what, 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 I, what, I, what I take away from this, is that we need to apply this to our lives. That we need to turn off the noise from our radio and from our TV, and we need to hear God. We need to hear God's voice speak through Jesus. We need to, to hold his word in our hearts. We need to treasure it and delight in it and uphold it and pray and pray it in our lives. This morning, do we, do we believe this? Do we believe that, that God's word is, is so much greater than anything else in this word, in, the, in this world? Do we believe that, that Jesus is the source of truth and wisdom? That he is the, the word that was made flesh and that dwelt among us? I believe why this is, this is why it's so important for us to, to be renewed in his truth daily. That we spend time in God's word, that we meditate on his promises and that we delight in his commands. Colossians 3, 16 through 17 says, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual psalms, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. This is what we're called to. As Christians, as, as followers of Jesus, as disciples of Christ, as we're, we're called to be filled with the words of Christ. J.C. Ryle says, the, the whole conclusion of the vision was calculated to leave a lasting impression on the minds of the three disciples. It taught them in the most striking manner that their Lord was far above them, and the prophets, and is the, as the master of the house is above the servants, and that they must in all things believe, follow, obey, and trust, and hear him. That we're called to, to listen to him, to not trust in our own way, but to trust in his ways. To not look to our society for, for direction, to not look to our world for, for their opinions, but that our full dependence and our hope and our trust would be in God's word alone. So we have Jesus revealed and, and Jesus reveals, verses 18 through 13. Suddenly, when they looked around, they saw no one anymore, but only Jesus with, him, with themselves. Now, as they came down from the mountain, he commanded them that they should tell no one the things that they had seen. So the Son of Man had risen from the dead. The disciples' preview of glory concludes, and they are, they are there alone with Jesus. And I'm sure as they were, were pondering all these things that they had just seen, probably didn't know what to, to expect or what to think, but they had just seen Jesus manifest his presence in his life, his deity. And he commands them not to tell anyone until Jesus arose from the dead. I believe that this was forever etched in their minds, in their memory of this miraculous event. Peter said this in, in 2 Peter 1, 16, For we do not follow cunningly devised fables, when we made known to you the power of, and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 
but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he, re, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when, he, when we were with him on the holy mountain. The disciples at this moment in Mark 9, didn't grasp the, the significance and they didn't grasp the, the death and the resurrection of Jesus and how that would all happen. They still didn't comprehend that, that Jesus' mission as the Messiah was, was to go to the cross, was to suffer and to be rejected by the elders. But Jesus was, was patient with his disciples like he is patient with us. We talked about it before that so many times we, we don't get it. So many times we, we miss it, what God is trying to show us. And God is patient and God is faithful to, to show us again. In fact, I don't think that when God tells you something, if you don't learn from it, that it just keeps happening over and over in our lives. Until we learn to, to trust God, until we learn to, to obey God and to, to have faith in what he's telling us, the lesson keeps repeating in our lives. God is, is wanting us to, to trust him with, with everything in our lives. To depend on him, to, to put our hope in him, to, to realize that, that, that even though the world is in chaos, that God is still able to work in our lives, that God is still able to, to work his plan out in our lives and he's, and he's actively doing it in our lives. He's actively doing it in our world. And so many times we, we don't see it because it's not something that, that's being promoted, but God is, is working in, in our world. God is saving lives. God is restoring people. God is bringing people back into a relationship with him. Praise God for his, his faithfulness and his patience with us. Verse 11, and, and they asked him, saying, Why do the scribes say that Elijah must come first? Then he answered and told them, Indeed, Elijah is coming first and, and restores all things. And how it is written concerning the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be betrayed and be treated with contempt. But I say to you that Elijah has also come and they did to him whatever they wished as it was written of him. That Jesus clarifies and he answers the disciples about the coming, about Elijah coming first to restore all things. Matthew 17, 13 says that the disciples understood this, that he was speaking about John the Baptist. For it was John the Baptist that, that came in the, in the spirit and the power of Elijah when he, was, when he prepared the way of the Lord. It was, a, it was his witness that the Jewish leaders didn't receive. And the Messiah's witness to them that they, they would also not receive either. That Jesus would, would, would suffer and be crucified and, and go to the cross of Calvary because it was the plan and the purpose of God. So this morning as we, as we bring things to a conclusion, some things that we can, we can take away today in our lives. First is the, the transfiguration demonstrated that Jesus is truly the Son of God. That there's no, nothing and no one that, that stands beside Jesus. That Jesus is worthy of all worship. He's worthy of all praise. Secondly, is that, that Jesus is the Messiah. And that He came to fulfill the law and the prophets. That Jesus was, was ready and he was, he, was, he was ready to fully obey the Father's will. It was Jesus who, who loved us and gave himself for us on the cross to be the ransom for us all and to make, the, make a way to the Father. Thirdly, that Jesus wants to, to reveal himself to us. 
That is, as Jesus revealed himself to his disciples, that Jesus wants to reveal himself in our lives. Look what it says in John 14, 21. Whoever has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me, he will be loved by my Father, and I too will love them and will show myself to them. What an incredible promise that, that God wants to reveal himself in our lives. That he wants to, to work in our struggles, that he wants to, to, to show himself in our lives. And he's waiting to, to, for us to, to, to trust in him, for us to, to depend on him, for him to, to work in our lives. To show us his power and his, his mercy and his grace in our lives. Fourthly, is that the Father confirms his love and his pleasure for his beloved Son. That as a Father has endorsed him, as the Father has recognized his sonship, even here in the transfiguration, that, that we should also love him and take delight in him. That we should hear his word, that we should treasure in our hearts by trusting it and by following him with all of our whole hearts. Let's pray this morning. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that the God of heaven would, would step down and would put on flesh. Lord, how great of a mystery this is, Lord. Lord, that we, Lord, that we could comprehend your, your great love for us, Lord, that you would come and rescue us, God, on a a rescue mission to give your life for us, to, to sacrifice your life and give everything for us who don't deserve it. And so, Lord, we thank you for that. We thank you that, Lord, if there's some anybody here in this, in this room this morning that maybe has never put their faith and their trust in you, I pray, Lord, that this morning that you would draw them to a relationship with you. If you don't know what to say, all you have to, to say, believe in your heart and, and trust in Jesus and say, God, I know that I've, I've sinned. I know that I've messed up. I know that I've ruined my life. But I acknowledge that, that Jesus came. I acknowledge that Jesus paid for my sins upon the cross of Calvary. I confess him as Lord and Savior of my life. Help me to live for him. Help me to trust him with my life and help me to follow him all of my days. And Lord, I pray, God, this morning for those who are, are struggling, God, with things in their lives, things that are, are, are hurting them, things that are, are causing them, God, to, to question your faithfulness. I pray that this morning, God, that you would reveal yourself to him today. Lord, we ask this in your name. Amen.